we get into routine, Rich. We <laughs> and you have a psalm like that, it's hard to leave out those verses. We had a, I did a funeral once for a neighbor. They were not really actively involved in any sort of church. They had a big group of friends from the Masonic Lodge that came to the funeral, and I thought, I will read the 23rd Psalm, but I'll read it in a version, a modern-day version. It would be easy to understand because these people, they're not used to reading the old language Bibles, so I read it in the, a newer version. Those people who were not part of any churches, they came up to me afterwards and said, wait a minute, when I was a kid, I heard that, and it was different. It had these and thous, and it was interesting. We, we get into routines, don't we? We get into things that we just accept and we take for granted because that's the way we operate. And we started talking last week about the idea of word problems, that we have word problems. And it's not just a math problem, but it's a problem with our words. And I don't know where you get your news or what you watch on TV, but everywhere you look, we see word problems, don't we? We see it in political wrangling and campaigns that there are word problems. We see that there are racial word problems in our world today. We see that there are economic word problems, people talking about fears and, and the problems of the market and what's going to happen or could happen. We see relationship word problems. Oh my goodness. All it takes is a word spoken in a certain way to break a relationship or to bring tension into it. And we see problems between people arise because of words. We see in the entertainment industry, we see word problems that language and intent and innuendo just creep in there and it taints our world. We have word problems. And we as Christians need to deal with word problems. And I want to say, we're not going to be talking about all the word problems that are out there in the world. There are plenty of those. What we need to talk about are the word problems that are right here. You say, wait a minute, Doug. Wait, wait a minute. I'd rather talk about the president and his word problems. I'm sure you would. I would too. But that doesn't change me. It doesn't draw me any nearer to God if I talk about somebody else's problems. I need to look at myself. And so today, not just today, but always, we need to be looking right here. Who does God want me to be? Who has God planned for me to be? Has God called you for a specific purpose? Everybody go like this. Yes, he has. You may not believe it. But I'm telling you today, he has called you. He knew you before you were born. He did not make you by accident. God set into motion this whole plan that he is going to bring to fulfillment one day. And each of us are part of it in some way. So we need to think about what is going on in my life, in my world, with my words what kind of word problems do I deal with? I set out for you last week a, a verse that's important for us to, to consider, to remember. It comes from Proverbs 18, verse 21, where Solomon says this. He says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The idea is the tongue is powerful. And we talked last week about a power problem we have with words. That words are powerful to effect, to change, to influence a person's life. And you have the choice to speak life or death when you speak. One word has the power to change the whole tenor of a conversation. One word has the power to destroy the confidence of a child or to rebuild it. One word is powerful enough to have somebody believe that they're worthless for most of their life, or to affirm their greatest gifts and abilities. One word is powerful enough to stop gossip in its tracks or pour gasoline on its fire. 
Words are powerful. Went to the Museum of Tolerance up in L.A. And I had always wondered, what would it, how did it, it just, I couldn't believe. How can you take a nation of intelligent people and cause them, make them to do such horrible things that the Germans did in World War II? How can you do it? And at this museum, they showed us how they did it. It was the power of words. That people were allowed to speak specific words of hatred and diminution as they tore down the Jewish population and pointed the finger. And pretty soon the whole nation joined a few people to kill and murder millions. The power of words is immense. We talked about how sometimes power can be misused, and we need to understand it. James talks about the power of words. He said, words are like this. You put a bit in the mouth of a horse, and you can turn that whole animal wherever you want it to go. He said, huge ships are controlled by a little tiny rudder wherever the pilot wants it to go. He said, a whole forest fire is decimated by a single spark. And he said, the tongue is just like that. It's a spark among our members. It sets on fire the course of our lives and itself is set on fire by hell. He said, Satan is involved in trying to destroy our world and he does it mostly through words. And so we need to be careful about the words that we speak. We need to understand that there is power in those words. I just want to drop this in your ear too. There is power in unspoken words. Somebody once told me that the loudest, that silence is one of the loudest voices that we have. But sometimes we forget or we refrain or we pull back and we don't say something that needs to be said. Something to affirm somebody, something to encourage somebody. We need to speak words. We need to use the power that God gives us, but we need to be careful with the power. Our words are powerful. We know that from personal experience, from what people have said to us. And I tell you what, they say when you speak to a child a negative word, it takes 10 positive words to counterbalance that. And I know that's true. You know that's true, don't you? I, just personal experience. I can stand here and I can preach, I think, God's word to you. And I've got 20 people walking out the door going, Dad, touched my life that spoke god spoke to me through that but one all it takes is one to say man you not too long and guess what i remember all those positive comments no we have a tendency to focus on the negative and to hold that because there's power in words, and especially power in negative words. And we need to be careful how we use that power. We know that words are powerful from the teaching of James. He says it can set a whole forest on fire. It can set a whole life on fire. And so sometimes we say words, and we didn't really want it to come out that way, and we try to distance ourselves from our words that we say. We say things like, oh, I didn't mean to say that. Oh. Sorry, that didn't come out the right way. We say, oh, yeah, that was just a slip of the tongue. I don't know where that came from. And that's the word we use a lot. Where did that come from? We spew certain things and, and then we catch ourselves and go, whoa, wait a minute. How did, where did that come from? We get off the freeway, we get cut off on the freeway, and we're just, we unload a leash of, a, a load of, of words, and, and then we go, whoa, where? Where did that come from? We, we let our temper flare with our children. And we say things that we never thought we'd ever say. And we stop and go, whoa, where did that come from? We join in a gossipy story about a family member or even somebody at church. And we walk away and then we think, oh, why did I say that? We get angry. 
watching our favorite football team on Sunday after we've been to church and we let out us well, we tell the refs what to do over this TV screen. And then we look around and go, whoa, where did that come from? Or we're even involved in a, a friendly, friendly game of a golf out there and something happens. I heard a guy the other day, he said he went and played a game of Frisbee golf or, or golf Frisbee or, or whatever you call it when you fling your nine iron off into the woods with a, with a string of expletives behind it. And we, we go, whoa. Where did that come from? Jesus today is going to show us where that comes from. He's going to say we've got a power problem. But he's also going to say we've got a storage problem. And we need to be careful about the things we store. Because they come out. Our grandchild when she was about three. She got in the car, jumped up behind the steering wheel, and was pretending to drive. She stood up there, grabbed that steering wheel, and started going like this. Out of my way. Get out of my way. Who taught you to drive? Open your eyes. And we're standing there going, where did this come from? As we looked at mom and dad. <laughs> and they said, oh, not us. But you know what? She stored that from someplace. And guess what came out? The things that she had stored. Jesus says this. He said, some of the things that come out of our mouths might not be as random or as unintentional as we think they are. Sometimes the things that come out are the things that we've heard the things that we have said, the things we have read, the things that we have put in our minds, the things that we have put into our storage units that are in our minds. And at the root of every word, we might find a storage problem. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 6, starting verse 43. He says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, if you've got a tree and it's a good tree, it's going to bear good fruit. If it's got good soil, it's got good roots, it's got the good wood, it's got the good DNA, it's going to bear good fruit. And if it doesn't, if it's got bad DNA, it's going to bear bad fruit. He goes on, though. He says, a good, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And then he says this. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And Jesus says, we've got a storage problem. We've got a problem because the words that come out don't always reflect the glory and the beauty of the Lord, do they? They don't always reflect the intent of the Lord because sometimes we've got stuff stored in our hearts that are finding their way out. I spoke at a, an event once on on the, on the platform there was speaking with me was, was Daryl Sheets. Daryl was one of the stars in the, in the TV show, The Storage Wars, if you ever watched that. Um, and before the, before the program, sitting in the green room, talking with Daryl, he said, you know, we, we go and we see all these storage units. They're all full, they're all filled out, but 99% of what people store is either forgotten or it's trash. He said, we find a few good things in there, and that makes a TV show, but 99% but of stuff goes to the dump. It's trash. It needs to be trash. But people have stored it away, and they've forgotten about it. And that's why they get all these storage units that they can buy on auction and hope that there's a, a little find in there that somebody's forgotten about. 
And sometimes we stuff things into our brain and we forget about them. And sometimes we stuff things into our brain that shouldn't be stuffed in there at all. Because eventually that door is going to be opened. There's going to be a trigger that opens that door. And then out comes the things that are stored there. Whether it's good or bad. Whether it's evil or righteous. Those things find a way of coming out. My mother-in-law came down with Alzheimer's. And here's what happens sometimes. <clears throat> when you have the, with the disease of Alzheimer's, sometimes your personality changes. It can change for the good, which Julie's father, he had Alzheimer's, and he got sweeter and sweeter as the days went by. Her mother had the opposite problem, and she became hard to deal with. And often an Alzheimer's patient will let go with a worse stream of expletives that they never would have said in their conscious minds. And Julie's mother tried to let the expletives flow. But here was the really fascinating thing. She had no expletives stored in her brain. <laughs> she had stored good things in her brain. And you could see her struggle to try to find something to really cut deep. And she, you, you, and the harshest word that she ever found was fool. <laughs> you fool. She said that a lot. But it was because she had never stored all those words, all those scenes in her brain. She lived a very pure life. And when that disease tried to open that floodgate of storage, nothing came out except for mild words. Jesus says the mouth speaks from what the heart stores. And so we need to be careful what we store because it comes out. Maybe not always when we're diseased with Alzheimer's, but it comes out in stressful situations. It comes out when you don't want it to come out it comes out and it speaks what is really in the heart jesus said every tree is going to be recognized by its fruit every heart is going to be revealed by what is spoken what's really there we can put on a good we can put on a good show on sunday morning can't we we can talk about good things we can talk about righteous things we can go to bible studies after bible studies but the real test is what happens in those moments when somebody rubs you wrong? I want to live in the right. I want to speak words of life and not death. I want to do all these things, and I try to. But you know, every once in a while, there's, there's that person that just kind of drags me to the dark side. I don't know what it is, but they just rub you the wrong way. And you say or you think even things that you go, wait a minute. Where did that come from and then I have to do some readjustment do some self-examination and look at my life and sometimes I don't have I'm not good at that we're this way we can make excuses for ourselves up and down the block all the time can't we well I only do this this time I only do this and it's only because of that and it's only, we make excuses for ourselves right and left and we're really good at it and what we're bad at is really self-reflection self-examination and we might need some help we might need a brother sister or family member that we really trust think about doing this ask them from my speech what do you think is in my heart what kind of person am i really i mean i can be good sometimes but sometimes there's a, there's a twisted side. Does that ever come out? Is that ever visible? And ask somebody that you trust because we often see the faults in other people better than we see our own. But you gotta, you gotta ask somebody that you trust. Somebody you know who loves you and wants your best. And then listen to what they say. Jesus says, <clears throat> even though my intent is to speak good things, Jesus says, I will speak what's consistent with my heart, with my nature. A tree 
will produce what its nature says. If it's an apple tree, don't ask it for pears. It's not going to make them. It's going to make apples. If my heart is bad, don't ask it to be good. It's going to produce what's bad. I need help to change my nature. Changing my nature is not easy. So we say, well, I'm going to watch my words from here on out. I'm going to, I'm going to be careful what I say. And we try and we try and we fail. When the times get tough, we fail at it. And we will let out the things that we didn't mean to say. And then we go, oh, man. Because, it do, because our nature hasn't been changed. We're still an apple tree trying to produce pears. We need to change our nature. How do you do that? You can't do it on your own. It takes some supernatural help. And God gives us a gift that we don't always utilize. He said on the day of Pentecost, when the people came to Peter and they heard the story of how they had killed Jesus and they were cut to their heart and they said, what do we do? We killed the Son of God. What do we, where do we go from here? He said, here's what you do. You repent. You be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God says, I will come live in you. And I will provide the power that will change your nature. But sometimes we don't understand that spirit. and We don't listen to the spirit. And we don't follow the spirit. And we don't embrace the power of that spirit to change who we really are. And we'll go to a Bible study. We'll study about the spirit. But we go out unchanged. Because we haven't listened to the power. We haven't obeyed the power of that spirit. Here's what Paul says. The spirit, if we let the spirit live in our lives... Here's what the Spirit will produce. The Spirit bears its own fruit. He says the Spirit bears the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He said if you let the Spirit live in you, the Spirit will produce these things. And I have to look at my life. Is this being produced? Am I loving more? Am I being kind? Am I being patient? What about self-control? Am I letting the Spirit work in me? Because if I do, he says, this is what the Spirit bears. I've heard a lot of lessons on the fruit of the Spirit saying, okay, we need to practice patience more. We need to practice self-control. We need to practice... and." And yes, we do. We need to make some decisions. I'm going to try to act godly. But we often forget the part that says, this is the fruit of the Spirit. This is not our fruit. This is a storage problem. When I store the Spirit and His nature and His power in my heart, He produces the fruit. He changes me from the inside out. He's the one who can change my nature not just my exterior. And so we need to believe what Jesus said. We need to believe what Peter said. You will be given the gift of the Spirit. You're baptized into Christ. You repent from your sins. And you are given this gift of the Spirit. We need to believe that. And just this too. Surprised me one day. I was reading through the the book of Luke. I'd read this story a lot of times. But I'd read it from Matthew. And it didn't catch me in Luke. But in Luke, he says it a different way. In Luke 11, starting verse 11, he says, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, which of your fathers will give him a scorpion? He says, If you then, though you are evil, if you then know how to give good gifts, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit? To those who ask him. When's the last time you asked God to fill you with the Holy Spirit? God says, we need it today, don't we? 
I need it every day. Because there are things stored up here. There are things stored in here that I want cleaned out. And I can't do it on my own. I don't have the power to change my nature. But God does. We have a problem sometimes listening to the Spirit. We have a problem following the Spirit. We have a problem obeying the Spirit. And we have a problem storing the right things. We store all kinds of things. As Daryl Sheets said, most of it's junk. But we need to store our good things. We need to start filling our storage units with the Word of God. And then that will be the power behind our words. Here's what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, talking about the beauty of the Word of God, the power of His law. And he wrote this. He said, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? Well, he does it by living according to your word. That's how he does it. And then he says, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. And then he says, I have hidden your words in my heart so that I won't sin against you. I have stored up your words so I will be changed. I have stored your words so that what comes out of me is are words of the Spirit and words of God and words of life and not words of death and not words of discouragement. I have put your word in my heart so I can speak the things that you want me to speak. Jesus said to the disciples, I'm going to send you a comforter, an advocate. I'm going to send you the Spirit to remind you of all the truth. Well, how can you remind somebody if they don't have it stored there in the first place? The psalmist said, I will hide it in my heart. I will store in my heart. What does that mean to us? How do we store his word? It's not hard. I heard it. We just read it. We get into it. We value it. It's something that we put as a priority. We store all kinds of things. I was always amazed. I had kids come to me when I was doing youth ministry and say, I'm just not good at memorizing. I, I just can't, I just can't learn. I can't. But you know how many baseball stats they knew? They knew baseball stats from before they were born. They could rip these things off. Well, they had this average and that average, and they did this and those teams and that teams, and they both. They, I said, Who says you can't memorize? Who says you can't store these things in your heart? We memorize and we learn the things that are important to us, don't we? The psalmist said, your word, God, is important to me. He goes on, he says, praise be to you, Lord, teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I say them over and over. I cement those in my heart. He says, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts. I think about them. I don't just go to church and say, well, I heard something, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I stop and I think about them and I soak in them and I think about how they apply to my life. I meditate on your precepts and I consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. And he says, I will not neglect your word. Would you be willing to say that with me? Don't say it if it's not true. But if you want to store good things in your heart so that good things come out, we must not neglect his word. If you're willing, say this with me. He says, I will not neglect your word. That's a prayer. And it's a promise to God. And I can't always do that on my own. Sometimes I need people around me to help me. I need to enlist a mentor. We are, dis we are studying discipleship in this church and what it means to really grow in maturity. And often what it means to grow in maturity is to find somebody to follow. You find somebody to teach you, somebody to encourage you, somebody to, to hold you accountable. It means following and intentionally growing so that we don't neglect his word, so that we store up 
God's life. So we speak life and not death. We've got storage problems. We need to do some inventory. What's in that storage unit that needs to be cleared out and what needs to be stored in there? And nature abhors a vacuum. Jesus talks about somebody who's cleansed from a demon and if they just, if they don't fill it with something good, that vacuum will bring in more demons. He says, fill up your storage unit with good things. Let's pray. Father, there is stuff all around us. You've told us, Father, that pure religion involves keeping ourselves unspotted, unpolluted by the world, and yet we live, Father, in a world of pollution. And I pray that you would help us to store good things and not the polluted things. Help us to store your word. Father, encourage us when we think on your word, we read your word, Help us to see you, open our eyes, guide us by your spirit, change our hearts, change our nature. Father, make us, please, we pray, to be people who speak life and not death. To speak encouragement, not discouragement. Father, who speak your heart and your will and your peace and your patience and the joy that we have in following you, may our lives overflow with gratitude because of your indescribable gift. God, we thank you. May our lives reflect that gratitude that's stored up in our hearts. And may your name be praised. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have storage problems, but Jesus says this. He says, your lives are full of sin. That started in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve decided to follow their own ways instead of God's ways. And ever since then, we have been plagued with this idea of selfishness. Of seeking my ways instead of God's ways. And we have gotten polluted. But Jesus says, I'll take that away from you. I will pay the price for your sin. I will die on the cross. And then what Paul comes back in Galatians 3, he says, when you're baptized into Christ, you are clothed with Christ. You are covered with him. He says, as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have been clothed with him. So when God looks at you, he sees what you're clothed with. He doesn't see all the garbage that we've been through. He sees purity. He sees a blameless sinless, beautiful person that he calls his child. He says, what you need to do is believe me, trust me, put me to the test, die to yourself, be baptized into Christ, be clothed with him, and walk in the power of that spirit and see how he can change your life. This is not a self-help thing. It's a sacrifice thing. To say, I believe in God and who he says he is. And I'll put my trust in him. We can do that because he's proven himself trustworthy. Over all the ages, as he's dealt with difficult people, he's always been faithful. And he'll be faithful today. If you're ready to give your life to Christ today, to be baptized into him, to be clothed with Christ, we're ready to help you do that today. You can come down here in the front and say, I'm ready. And let us help you while we stand and sing this song.